Thank you, Stefanud. You will hear me well, I hope so. So let's move from um, the heads of states into the machinery. Uh, so my name is Maritska Gandria. I am the director of the Internal Market Division in, uh, in the Secretariat. And uh, as it's been mentioned a couple of times, this is what we call the machinery of the agreement here in Brussels. Um, this means that uh, we have uh, the responsibility of all the policy areas or within the EA agreement and also for preparing all the legal acts uh, for further incorporation into the agreement. And the Secretariat, as Hegos was mentioning, is assisting the member states in the management of the agreement. And here also the Internal Market Division has an important role. I will uh, introduce you to what this work is all about, the structural framework that we work within, and also the role of the Secretariat in this EEA work. And finally, I will take the opportunity to highlight a couple of uh, special areas that has been high on the agenda for us, uh, or for all of us in, in uh, lately. So, mm, let's go ahead now, that was wrong, right? Here. This shows an, an overview on when and how Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein can be a part of uh, the participant and do the participation and engagement in the process. Again, you can here recognize the two pillars. On the right, you see the EU process, very, very uh, sort of um, shortly described. And on the left side, uh, you will see uh, how the EFTA states are contributing. We are contributing all along the way, and the Secretariat has the role to assist along the way. But to better grasp what the management of the agreement is all about, I would like to show you some numbers. At the time of the signing of the agreement, that was a couple of years before it took, uh, came into force, in 1992, we had 1,875 acts incorporated into the agreement. Today, we are at about 14,000. That is quite a lot. And about 6,000 plus acts are still in force. And this is because some acts are repealed or they are replaced by others. The area of food of, of, and veterinary uh, is by far the biggest one, representing 40% of all the acts incorporated. This allows us to have full compliance with the EU rules on the food chain. It means frictionless export of seafood and ag agricultural goods. And it means no veterinary import or export controls because, because we are a full member or we are fully in line with, with the, the rules that are um, the same rules that are all over the, the EEA. Apart from customs, since we are not a part of the customs union. Then we have some other high volume um, sectors, transports, air, road, maritime and general transport, financial services and goods. And that is technical regulations and specifications related to industrial goods and, and all the goods. And um, this means, of course, that engagement in the development of new legislation in the, at the EU level, followed by timely incorporation, is essential. Because, as Hege was saying, the aim for our work is to ensure a homogeneous internal market throughout the EEA. And we do that with the homogeneity that, of course, timely incorporation is, so in, is going to serve. Also, the dynamic nature of the agreement that we are, in fact, incorporating new act. This is not a static agreement. And it is consensus based. These are the principles. That sounds easy, doesn't it? Well, there are some challenges because of the nature of this agreement. One of the things is that to achieve this homogeneity, we need speedy incorporation. And this incorporation, it takes time by nature. Why? Well, because we just start 
the moment the EU formally adopts a legislation. So we are already starting a bit behind. This means that, for instance, we are having a sort of a backlog, we, what we call it, which means that there are acts that are waiting to be incorporated into the agreement. Also, increased complexity of new EU acts to incorporate. This will cause uh, additional delays because we have to assess it on our side and we have to find ways that it fits into the agreements. Hege was mentioning agencies, so new powers is given to EU authorities. This we didn't even think of when we signed the agreement. So um, this is ch uh, challenging the two-pillar structure, which means that we have to find solutions. We have to make um, the le EU legislation fit in to the agreement that both the EU and we are part of in this sense. And then finally, we have had some, or, or and of course, the increased volume of acts. Uh, EU is producing even more. We're having big packages and big, and big uh, uh, challenges like uh, environment. We are having the Green Deal and so on. That really makes the volume increase, which is, of course, uh, is influencing our work. Um, Brexit and COVID has also given us some new new uh, challenges that I will mention a bit later on. So, to help us and to facilitate the EU work and to meet the challenges we have, there is a structural setup, as Hege was mentioning. Uh, assist, uh, and, and the Secretariat has then a role in assisting the Member States. When we talk about the incorporation to the EU agreement, we are at this level. Standing Committee is the highest body as Hegel was saying. And this, um, but of course, before a legal act comes there ready for incorporation, there has been a lot of work done already. For months, sometimes even for years. So going a bit backwards <clears throat> in time, uh, this is about the, how EU law becomes EEA law. And I will give you a glimpse of this work and the role of the Secretariat in this, um, this process. So this is under or behind the Standing Committee. The Standing Committee is then assisted by four subcommittees, or you, actually five, but four uh, when it comes to the areas of the agreement. You see there are the three of them uh, are taken care of and responsible for the four freedoms. And the last one, is flanking and horizontal pol policies. Uh, in these subcommittees, we have the Minister of Foreign Affairs in uh, our member countries represented. And that's sort of the first step of the more formal incorporation procedure. But again, before that, a lot of work has been done in our expert groups and working groups. As you can see, uh, and these are not all of them, but we have also working groups within the secretariats in the sense that my officers have divided the agreements and all these policy areas in between them. And they have they are responsible for all of these working groups in these working groups. Uh, we have experts coming from the capitals, either from the ministries or authorities who are experts in these different fields. Some of the areas is so technical that we even have uh, export groups that are mainly under the technical barrier to trade. And um, the working groups somehow is our window to the world because this is where it all starts. When an, an EU act is adopted, actually on the fifth floor here, our year register, it comes in to us. She registers it and sends it to the expert responsible for the expert group, and that's how it goes out to the countries, uh, to our member states. And we assess, and the member states assess, and that's how you start looking into uh, to the work. And the luxury we have is that we would invite the commission, we would invite stakeholders or anyone who has a say, even at an early, uh, early process, uh, early stage of the process, where they can come to us we can discuss together to better understand um, what the Commission is thinking and, and what the Member States are thinking of the proposals and the way of head. And that's also a way of how we 
can do our contribution. So that was the structure. What about the work? Well, the work is divided, we can divide in two strands. One is the decision shaping. That is participation in the development of the EU legislation before EU adoption. And it is decision making or incorporation into the agreement of an adopted EEA, EU EEA relevant act. And during the decision shaping, which is actually even at the level where the EU side is thinking of creating new policies, they are making studies. Uh, and before they make a proposal, we have a formal way of um, participate and we have a um, informal way of participating. The formal participation is in the EU expert groups and committees. This comes from the EEA agreement where we are said to be consulted at the same level as the member states. So participation in these expert groups in the Commission is of course essential for us. There are hundreds of them and all different levels, uh, all different areas of the EEA agreement. Uh, then we have the early assessment by the EA EFTA uh, expert groups of EU ch EA challenges. And again, we can go and we are well, very welcome by the Commission to discuss, to understand better what they are thinking and how we can then fit it into our system. And then, of course, there is the informal contact where we after where we don't have a formal role from the EA agreement, but when the proposal is gone from the Commission to the EU member states in the Council and to the European Parliament. Uh, both our experts um, from the capitals, but also assisted by our, uh, our officers, would uh, then reach out to stakeholders, but also, of course, then policymakers and decision makers in the EU bodies uh, to, try, uh, um, to try and be a part and contrib contribute to a, a um, legal uh, to, to making the, the legal acts and, and the new legislation something that would and, and give our input, sometimes even having the best practices or good practices learning from each other. This is, of course, a very time consuming part of the work. And unfortunately, um, the challenge is also that since we have the incorporation uh, process with its deadlines, this is what we have to do. So, so the decision, being a part of the decision shaping is challenging, but we are still prioritizing it and you will hear a bit about it later on today. The second part of our work, I'm not going to say too much about, that's the decision making. Um, the decision shaping was the blue part, then we have uh, the red part all the way through what the Secretariat is assisting uh, and we have close cooperation with the EU side. Uh, until the point where we agree on a joint committee decision that we then send to the joint committee and they uh, adopt it. But the Secretariat's role along here is also to assist the member states. We are facilitating the work through the working group. We are in, in inviting, um, uh, inviting them to come here, of course, uh, during COVID more online, but, uh, but this is all a part of the work that uh, that uh, helps in the decision making process. And that is uh, also so, some kind of addition to the legal work. I just wanted to show you this one because I mentioned a bit the backlog and the fact that uh, the agreement itself um, makes us lag a bit behind. This is very new statistics and I'm not going to go all the way into the details, but if you see over there, uh, at the far right, for those of you sitting there, um, you see that uh, last year there were more than 700 acts adopted on the EU side. And in fact, on into the uh, EA agreement, we had 663 acts, and of those more than 721 acts, uh, 60 of them are were not EA relevant. So as you see, even if we have a backlog, the speed of the and the capacity and what we are doing is not too bad if you compare it to the uh, enormous amount of acts decided upon every year. Uh, the red line you see there, or orange, is the so-called is the, the monitoring list showing which 
how many acts that are awaiting incorporation that are enforced in the uh, that are adopted on the EU side, but no, uh, not yet, <clears throat> not yet uh, incorporated into the EU agreement. So even if we have a backlog, the, we are constantly looking into our procedures. Uh, this is, um, of course, handled by the Secretariat, but in close cooperation with um, member states to improve. And also we have constant dialogues also with the EU side on this. So finally, I just want to mention a couple of hot topics that we have been uh, working with for for some of the last couple of years. Um, COVID-19 pandemic um, made us having to jump around and also on the EU side to have measures uh, to ensure and secure a continuous uh, well-functioning internal market. It was important for us to have uh, goods, foods, uh, medical um, uh, medical goods uh, across Europe, and it was essential to us that the EA uh, countries also were a part of this. So 81 COVID-19 related acts were incorporated since spring in 2020, and 17 of them were uh, characterized uh, in the way that uh, we had to incorporate them to special ur urgent written procedure, just to make sure that we um, well, maintained life and health, I suppose, and also or that we did not hamper the internal markets. And then we still, we're not done, so we're still doing this. And next week we will have additional 13 acts incorporated uh, through a special written procedure. Um, and the role of the Secretariat in this is that we closely monitor uh, all measures that are adopted by the EU in response of the uh, COVID-19 crisis. And we do assist the EFTA states with uh, any relevant uh, measures and and uh, to ensure a speedy um, a speedy incorporation. I'm not sure, but I, I've heard some rumors that uh, some of them were just uh, jumped around and incorporated with uh, you know a, a time frame that we have never seen. I think when it comes to incorporation into the agreement before. Um, then finally, another important area that Teg also mentioned a bit, the EU EFTA states, EA EFTA states participations in the programmes in 2021 to 2027. This is a cooperation outside the four freedoms, but it has its legal base in the EA agreement. The aim is to um, attain the objectives of the agreement or if uh, it's deemed to be of mutual interest of the parties. Um, no, um, so the EAF, the countries uh, do have a substantial uh, financial contribution. Uh, in 2020, it was 500 million euros. And now uh, in last year, it was close to 600 million euros. So we are basically paying for the pro programs that we are participating in, um, obviously. And again, uh, and uh, maybe especially for you uh, or for, for many of you, I suppose, Horizon Europe and Erasmus Plus accounts for more than two thirds of the total of the EA budget, EA EAFTA budget to the programmes. Horizon Europe is the, is the, um, um, is the big research programme, and this is, of course, also essential to the EAFTA states. In the, common, uh, in the, in the coming uh, next years, these are the programs that we will take part of. Uh, this will uh, help us uh, be integrated even further into the European uh, societies. It will uh, make our citizens and businesses develop, contribute to, to research and development that is uh, moving our societies forward to the benefit of our uh, citizens and to our businesses. If you want to know more about these programs, I suggest you to go into the EA, to the EFTA site where we have a special page on the EU programs. That was that for me as a kind of a crash course, and you will be no, served more details uh, later on today. Thank you. Thank you, Marit. And uh, yes, now we have. Uh, some time for questions, so uh, don't hesitate. We already have some questions in the chat. Um, 
first one is the uh, following. Thank you for your presentation. Do we think the principle of sovereignty would have been possible to uphold if EPTA had more member states that were also parties to the EU Sovereign Committee? Thank you. Does it work this much now? Yes. Yeah. Well, we, when the, the EEA agreement was negotiated, we had more uh, EFTA states. We had, in addition to our three states, we were Austria, Finland and Sweden, with the same principles that apply today. So that is my answer. And uh, yeah, I'd leave it at that. Mostly maybe it's a political question. <laughs> yeah, actually the same uh, has a follow-up question. Has the accession by a third country ever been discussed? Doesn't well, really define a third country if it's uh, Well, we have, we have of course, uh, enlarged the EEA uh, in parallel with the new EU member states. But when you think about other, possible other member, uh, EEA EFTA member states now, there's no, been no neg negotiation, so that's kind, no. Yes. Uh, any question from the audience? I have another point in the chat, but if the audience has any. Yes, there is a question over here. But, but first, uh, maybe Heike from the chat. Thank you uh, for a great introduction. Could you comment on Protocol 31? It's a very yes, old question. I'm very happy with the last part of Mari's presentation when she talked about uh, cooperation outside the four free freedoms and typically program participation, that is Protocol 31. Because the agreement itself foresee that the, the contracting parties may want to co cooperate closer in areas outside the four freedoms, and that is foreseen. And when we do cooperate in these areas outside the four freedoms, that uh, cooperation is incorporated into the EEA agreement, also through a decision by the Joint Committee, but it is put into Protocol 31 of the EEA agreement. And uh, there are certain, and so this is what we call voluntary participation. It is, uh, it is not required, but we want to participate. And there are certain uh, differences when it comes to implementation and enforcement. Because unless we, are, we, we decide so, the EFTA surveillance authority, for instance, they do not have any competence to, to, to uh, foresee that we implement this, uh, this. but of course we do. <laughs> yeah. Question for, I think, uh, my um, So my, my question is, um, how do you solve disagreements about whether an EU legal act is EA relevant? Uh, sorry. How do you solve a question when oh, yeah. of EEA relevance? Yes, of EA relevance agreement. Well, uh, whether I, first of all, uh, you will get even more information about this by my excellent colleague Fidel uh, uh, this afternoon, but to um, to make it very short, to, to judge whether uh, this legal act has any relevance. Uh, of course, uh, interesting enough, well, not into, well, it's a fact that, you know, on the EU side, they will also do this kind of assessment. So they will sometimes mark this is EA relevant. Sometimes they don't, and if they, it is still EA relevant. Uh, but um, the point is, uh, we have to, on the EFTA side, uh, assess that ourselves. And um, to put it short, it depends whether it's in within the scope of the EA agreements. If it is within the inter if there are internal market rules, for instance, it is EA relevant. But the agreement foresees that the final that this is a process leading up to uh, a, a decision by the joint committee in the end. Mm -hmm. So. The, the parties to the agreement, they need finally to agree on that question. Mm -hmm. And uh, should there be a disagreement, they need to find, resolve it in the committee. It, it, uh, there is, this is not a question that can be answered by the, by the court. It is for the party to have political dialogue to agree on finally. But very, mostly it's quite clear what it is, what is EA relevant, but it can be a question of 
All right, we have another question from the chat. Uh, are there any mechanisms in place to ensure uniform participation, in brackets, one voice, for national experts as there are expert groups both under the EU Commission and the standing committee? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, if you think of, of the experts of the Commission, and I, I'm sure the Commission representatives could arrest me if I say something wrong, but they are, of course, we are sending our national experts uh, from the member states, but they are also there as, next, uh, as experts. And no decision is really, I mean, we don't have a voting, vote, uh, voting right, but there is, we have a formal, um, formal right to be there and to discuss. Uh, but to ensure the same, um, uh, to say, um, to say unanimously between the working groups of EFTA and the working groups of Commission, I think they're just playing a bit two different roles. Um, so of course it is discussed, and, and but again, I mean, when you come from uh, from the capital, you you have your mandate from there. So uh, and I don't even know if there is a need to be unanimous there. It's uh, it's more a sense of contributing at an early stage in the expert groups. Thank you. There's another question here. Does the EA agreement feel any strain from the increase in acts adopted by the EU year on year? More than 700 acts adopted in 2021 seems like a big burden for both EFTA and the EU side process. It is, yes, but... Uh, yes, uh, I mean, yes. Uh, of course, this is uh, this is a challenge. Uh, it uh, demands uh, an incredible amount of resources. Uh, and this is also why I was, uh, as I was showing you, a part of why we have the backlog. Um, so I guess this is uh, an essential part of my job to make sure that our processes are working as good as possible. We do, do, do that also with the, uh, with the capitals. We look at our procedures constantly. I know, of course, uh, as um, our Secretary General was mentioning earlier that uh, the, the file, the EA file that used to be in the external ex, uh, um, action service of the EU is now moved to the Secretary General, uh, Secretary General's office. Uh, so hopefully, uh, and again, we are cooperating with them to make that work. And, and I think on both sides, we are looking at, uh, at ways of making our procedures uh, efficient. But yes, an increased amount of acts uh, we see that it's a fact, it is sort of, uh, it has an effect on the backlog, but it doesn't mean that we we will eventually get there, and, and we do, but resources is the key, for sure. Thank you. Maybe one last question before we break, uh, and I think Eke should take that one. Uh, I actually thought this question was not relevant any longer, but it's a, it's a ongoing question for the last years, uh, because as EFTA started, uh, when EFTA started, the uh, United Kingdom was a member, county member, uh, and now then they went to the EU, but after Brexit, could the UK get back into EFTA? As you say, it is a hypothetical question because that is a venue that uh, the UK has not chosen. But theoretically, the answer is yes, they could be a member of EFTA. Yes, and actually you find on our website both the EFTA Convention, Article 56, that defines how a new member state could, uh, or new state could become a member. And also through the EA, EA agreement, you find uh, also on the website, uh, Article 128, how uh, a, a new member state could possibly become party to the EA agreement. But this is all hypothetical analysis. So I think we can uh, break now. We are actually right on time. We'll have 10 minutes break. And uh, then we will have the Chair of the Apple Standing Committee and our counterpart from the uh, Secretary General uh, from the European Commission uh, showing how this works uh, on a higher level, we can say. But let's break now for 10 minutes. Thank you. We resume at uh, 10.40.